Well, sometimes people tell me when I preached a sermon that I've used a word in the sermon that they did not understand, um, which I never do on purpose, but uh, they say, you know, if you're a good pastor, you would uh, explain what those words mean. And um, so today I will try to explain to you a word that uh, I'm assuming most of you don't know uh, because I had never heard of it until this week. And uh, that word that I need to stop and explain to you is the word tassiography. Tassiography. Word you probably didn't use in a sentence this week. Tassiography. And if you did, I'm a little concerned. Uh, <laughs> tassiography, you probably haven't heard the word, and neither had I, but I had, uh, I had always heard like, the explanation of what it's about. Uh, tassiography. And, and it's a compound word. If you took French in high school, you might get the first part of it, tass is the word, uh, spelled tassi in, in English, but tas is the, the French word for cup, right? And then uh, graphe, if you are, uh, you know, even paying attention in English, but certainly if you, you are a Bible nerd and you took Koine Greek, you'd know that word graphe means writing. Uh, and so uh, you put those words together, cup writing, uh, you know, is this writing with a cup? No, it's not writing with a cup, uh, but it is uh, the writing that some believe is found inside of a cup, after you drink your tea and the dregs are left on the bottom. And the English phrase that you've heard many times, I'm sure, is reading the tea leaves. Now smile at me if you've heard that phrase before, reading the tea leaves. Well, that's called tassiography. Tassiography is, is reading the writings that's in the bottom of your cup. Now, here's the deal. There's always been, apparently, this cultic fringe on at least medieval Europe, and apparently all the way back to China, where people would try to read... The, uh, you know, the seemingly random like, dregs of, of, of debris in the bottom of a, of a, of a, of a teacup. Well, um, of course, it is occultic and strange, and I think the Bible is very clear. You should not engage in any of that, but, and it's not true, so that's all good. Let's just get that clearly stated. But let's just imagine, for the sake of illustration this morning, that what the diviners think is going on with this weird fringe cultic practice in history uh, were actually true. Let's just say when you drank your tea and what was left in the bottom of the cup actually did describe, as they say, your past and the present of your life, and then even it tells you something about the future. You just have to interpret this. It looks random, but let's just say for a moment that in it there was, you know, all this revealing information about like your life now and what's coming in the future. Uh, if that were the case, and yet you responded to your dirty cups the way you respond to your dirty cups now, which is, I'm assuming, you, you just see them, rinse them out, you know, put them in the dishwasher, or if you're a guy, you just put it in the sink, most of us. Uh, but, so, <laughs> sorry. But, you know, you, just, you want it to get, just get, rinse it out and clean it up, right? That's, that's what you do. And it, I would just say, if, if tassiography was real... It would, be, uh, it would be such a, a bummer that you missed out on all that information, kind of that commentary and insight on your life and all this, this predictive stuff about your future. That would be really sad. Um, which, of course, is not true. And I can tell you definitively that you should not waste your brain power trying to discern the uh, seemingly random dregs at the bottom of your teacup. But I can tell you on biblical authority, which may sound strange to you in an evangelical Bible teaching church, but I, I can tell you on biblical authority that you should spend some brain power trying to uh, interpret things that are going on in your life, in the environs of your life, and even the emotions of what's going on and what you're feeling inside. So much of the Bible, Jeremiah in particular, hits it all the time. You just look around, guys. Look around. See what's happening. You need to interpret what's going on here. I think of Haggai chapter 1. Just, he repeats it over and over. Consider your ways. And what does he mean by that? In the context, look around you. Look at all the stuff that's happening. Can you just see that God is trying to say something to you here? And that is very important for us to make those connections. God is trying to say something to us many times, not every time, but many times through the circumstances of our life and even through what I'm feeling on the inside of my life. Now, the reason I bring all that up is because we're going to look at a passage in Acts chapter 22 as we continue to work through Paul's testimonial here. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 11, where we get to something that is confessedly and admittedly, this is a miraculous conversion experience. Uh, God is doing some dramatic things, breaking natural law to stop 
the Apostle Paul, before he's the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus at the time he was called, to stop Saul in his tracks on the way to Damascus and redirect his life. Okay. Now, in biblical terms, there's a word for that. It's called repentance. He's trying to move Paul to repentance and give him a new direction in life. And it's going to happen in the most dramatic and spectacular way. And yet, what I'm finding in reading and studying this paradigm, this pattern of how God does that, working on the externals of his life and the internal workings in his life, that um, I want to look at how that works in our day, in our lives, right, without the, you know, the voice from heaven and the light shining around us. Like, how does God work in the circumstances of our lives? What does the Bible say in the rest of the Bible about that? And how does he work in the internal part of our lives? to do something that is akin to what's going on in Acts 22. Acts 22, he's driving Paul to repentance, okay? And, and, and very important, if you think about this whole series, like God's work in you, this may seem so historical to you, right? The history of my life, if you sit here today as a confessed Christian and you think you're walking with God, you'd say, well, there was a time when I wasn't, and all of a sudden then God worked in me, repentance and faith, and now I'm walking with Christ. I don't want us just to think about repentance as historical. And, and I think the insight simply uh, from a 500-year-old theologian who pointed out on the first theses of his 95 theses that he pinned to the Wittenberg door, uh, Martin Luther is helpful in just making the simple statement as he starts his 95 theses, which of course sparked the Protestant Reformation. He started with the fact that the, the master, the Lord, Jesus Christ, ha has, has made it so. He's commanded it to be, right, paraphrase here, that, that repentance would be the whole of the Christian life. Now, as I think about what I'm trying to distinguish here and compare, right, that is such an important statement. It is not just that repentance is something that starts the Christian life, but repentance, as Martin Luther rightly said, it really should be something that, that is a continual activity in the Christian life. I mean, he states it in a hyperbolous way. It is the whole of the Christian life. Well, it is in a sense. Now, I know he goes on to deal with the, the abuses of Rome and about their, 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 their stuff they were doing in terms of, of what they believe to be the sacrament of penance. And, and he moves through his, his theses in that direction to condemn the abuses of Rome. Fine. I'm just saying that first statement is so true. Jesus Christ has made it that we should understand that repentance is an ongoing process. And I can just prove that linguistically in the New Testament by saying every time the word repentance shows up, the Greek word metanoia in the Greek New Testament, more than half the times that the word is dropped in the text, it is directed toward Christians, people that are already followers of Christ. So I know this. I cannot become a Christian unless I repent, right? Uh, Luke 24, right? The gospel is laid out that, that repentance is to be proclaimed for the forgiveness of sins. That begins your relationship with God. But you don't have to be a Christian more than you know, 24 hours to find out, well, we continue to stumble through the Christian life, and there are many things that we need to repent of after we become Christians, right? So, so you would agree with that, right? You don't have to nod, and you don't have to get to raise your eyebrow, but you, you know that, right? We continually need to repent. And so I want to look at the historic retelling of Paul's testimony here, and not only speak to you if you are not yet a repentant following Christian, like a Christ follower. I want us to at least say, even if I sit here today and I became a Christian 30 years ago or 10 years ago or, or, or five days ago, you're going to need to repent often. And what I'm telling you is there's ways for you to read what's going on in your life, around your life, and in your feelings where God is trying to have you stop and read the tea leaves, so to speak. Now, I say that because much like when you have a dirty cup, you just clean it out and rinse it off. Sometimes you're going to have the experiences that we're going to talk about in this passage I mean, the, the non-miraculous variety of them. And you're going to say, well, I don't, don't feel right. Things are wrong. Things are messed up. And you're just going to want to rinse it out with a good night's sleep or maybe a walk on the beach or, you know, I maybe just need a good meal or I, I need to talk to a friend, talk it out, and then I'm done. But what a mess it would be if God's trying to say something to you through your circumstances and through your emotions. And you just say, well, I just need to clean it all up. Be careful that, that you don't waste opportunities for you to learn what God is trying to say to you. So let's read this text. Let's understand the, I get it, dramatic, like super big testimony of the Apostle Paul, where God is going to use him in such a great way, he starts his Christian life in a miraculous way. But let us learn from this and see what we can come away with in terms of being better at reading the, the, the quote-unquote tea leaves of our lives, if you'll allow that stretch of an illustration. All right, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Get your eyeballs on the text, please. Let's read what's going on here. You can find it on your phone. Go to esv.org. Um, bring your computers, bring your laptops, 
Uh, if, I, if the sermon gets boring, you can check the sports scores or whatever. But it's good for, I mean, we have free Wi-Fi. You might as well use it. And we want you to study with us. And that means that I have no problem with you bringing your technology. I mean, I don't want satellite dishes set up in the aisles or anything, but I, I'd be great if, if you were doing all you can with the resources you have to follow along. And I'm not sure why I'm saying all that uh, right now. But I'm going to read for you Acts 22, verses 6 through 11, okay? With a little bit of commentary, which you've become accustomed to. Verse 6. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus. Now, remember, he's saying all this because he's been, he's offended the Jews, right? The non-converted Jews here that think he's preaching against the Mosaic law and, and, de- and denigrating the Jewish people, and he's violating the rules, which he wasn't. But all of this is ultimately, he starts last week saying in the beginning of this testimony, I was like you. I was zealous against all these Christians, and I didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. That was the upshot of him saying, I was like you. Now we're going to say, here's how I repented. Here are the circumstances that led me to change everything about what I thought about Christ and how I lived. And so he's saying, I was going to Damascus. Well, we already know, he said, I was getting authorization from the leaders in Jerusalem to go up north to Damascus and to arrest Christians, bring them back to Jerusalem to be punished. So I'm on my way. I was almost there. It was noon. So it's midday. Sun is above his head. And a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. Okay, now the word heaven, I've said this many times, but let me just reiterate it again. The word heaven, both in Hebrew, Shemayim, or in, in, in Greek New Testament, uh, Arrhenus, is all, it all speaks to, th- it can speak contextually either to the sky where the birds fly or, or space, what we would call space, this cold vacuum of space where all the planetary you know, features are, or it can speak to this dimension that, that we know very little about, the place where God is, is resident in his glory, in unapproachable light. Okay, that, whatever that is, where God hangs out and Jesus is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, that, that can be called heaven. And it can also be called heaven, the stars and, and the, you know, the galaxies and all that, and the moon, that, uh, that's out there. And then there's the birds where the birds are flying. So all we know here about this, right, three different ways we can read this word, is that this is something, and it will be, and I've stated it already before we read it, a supernatural event. We've already got midday. The sun is already out, we're assuming. It's not just like the sun broke through the overcast skies. We've got now a a bright light that's so bright, we're going to find out it blinds him. So this is something miraculous and something big, and it's coming from like up in the sky. And that's the essence of what what we're, we're gathering from that statement. You'll see why I'm saying all that in a minute. Okay, a voice from heaven. And, and, and a light from heaven, rather. And he, fell, he falls to the ground, verse 7, which is a new detail we didn't get from Luke in Acts 9. So as I've often said he gets knocked off his horse, right? But that's the idea. He's on the ground now, and he hears a voice saying to him, and I'll read it the way it's written, and, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Of course, this is Paul. His old name was Saul. And it's a weird thing to hear. Like, here's this voice, and clearly this, this voice is coming from somewhere. It's authoritative. It's loud. It's, it's knocked me down, this light, and, uh, and, and I'm persecuting you? It seems like you are persecuting me right now. What are you talking about? Right? And, and so he asks, who are you, Lord? Now, I say that about heaven because the word Lord is the same way. Lord can be understood as, as a term that is used for the head of a domestic household, someone who's in charge of, of a household. And it can also be used for some kind of government official beyond, like in a community or in a nation, right? That the Herods or the Caesars would be lords. They would be people entrusted with authority. And then, of course, so many times the word kyrios, same word, Lord, 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 can also be describing the triune God, the Lord, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. He is God, right? The the Lord, he's in charge of all things. He is, as the Bible says, the Lord of lords, the Lord in charge of all the lords, no matter if they're domestic leaders or whether they're political leaders. So he says, he gets knocked off his horse, a light was shining around him, this voice comes out, and he says, who are you, Lord? Now, how does he mean that? Well, at this point, we're not sure exactly what he's thinking, except that I think he's attuned to the fact this is something big. And so who are you, strong and powerful one? Right? This is someone, does he think it's God? Well, I think he, he thinks he knows God, so he wouldn't be asking, who are you, God? Right? He, he's, he's a theologian, right? He doesn't accept and embrace Christ yet, but that's a weird question. The question should, in your mind, be, I'm just now facing something so big, I can't ignore it. It's so arresting. I've fallen down, and I'm saying, who are you, powerful one? Okay? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, which is a bit of a contradiction. Nazareth is just a little byway, you know, a little dusty, nowhere place. 
and yet that's where he was raised, and he's the one who says, I, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, which would be a sermon in, its, in itself, and we're not going to go that direction, but that is an interesting thing that the Bible says, that Jesus takes so personally the arresting of Christians in Damascus that he says, it's like you're persecuting me. And that's the analogy Paul loves to use later in his letters, that he is the head and we are his body. And you start picking on the church, you're picking on Christ, and Christ has all power. And so it says in this text, you're persecuting me, Jesus says to Saul. Verse 9, now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And that's an important thing to catch, because as we see this story retold in Acts 26, and we see it recorded by Luke in, in Acts 9, so we got three references in one book, right? That becomes a little bit confusing if we don't take them all and harmonize them. What we can realize by harmonizing them all is that the people that were with him in the entourage, however many there were going up to Damascus from Jerusalem, you need to understand, they heard something. They clearly saw something, but they didn't understand what was being said. And that's important. And I don't think it's just because he's, the, the God here is choosing, Christ is choosing a language that his entourage didn't know. And I know they were you know, multilingual in that day, but I'm just assuming something supernatural is happening with the light, with the sound, and even now with the perception of the message that God's trying to get across to him. And, and so they don't understand it around him, but he understands it. And he said, what shall I do, Lord? And you can see almost the, the, the credentials of the word curios going up. Right? Like, who, who, what, what am I supposed to do? And you say that to someone you're going to obey. And then I love this. Paul says in his testimony, and the Lord said to me, well, he knows now completely as a converted follower of Christ, he's the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. But he's going back to, I got knocked off my horse. Something bigger than me was accosting me and confronting me and a barrier and an obstacle to me doing what I wanted to do. And I said, who are you, Lord, one powerful one? And then it's like, uh, you know, well, I'm Jesus. Oh, okay. Well, he says, what, what should I do? Now I have no choice but to submit to this one who's flexed his power in front of me. And the Lord, the real Lord, the, the, right, the way he now sees it with full, clear obviously orthodox theology about Jesus being the Lord, right? The, the son of God. He says, arise and go to Damascus. The Lord said to me, arise and go to, okay, well, I was already going there, but now you're not going to go there for the same reason. I was going there to persecute Christians and arrest them, bring them back to, bring them back to Jerusalem and persecute them. Now I'm going to go to Jerusalem and, and I, I'm, I'm, or Damascus rather. And, uh, and Jesus says to him, I, I'm going to tell you then what, what you're supposed to know. And there you'll be told all that is appointed for you to do. So I'm going to give, more, give you more information, further instructions to follow. But right now, you continue on to Damascus, but you're not going to go there with the same agenda you had before. This is right, leading him to repentance, a whole different direction. Verse 11, and since, we, since I could not see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and came to Damascus. So they did not have the same blinding experience that Paul had. But Paul knows everything's changed now. I, I cannot continue to do what I was doing before. So these are the circumstances that lead him to faith in Christ. These are the circumstances that, that, that cultivate repentance. Okay, non-Christians here today, I want to tell you, you need to repent of your sins, which is primarily, in, 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 a, in an objective sense, you doing your own thing. 2 Corinthians 5.15, you're just doing whatever you want. You're like sheep wandering. You need to turn to Christ. So that's repentance. God may be using circumstances to get you there, including coming to church this morning. Well, that would be good. But a lot of us here are already confessing Christians. We know, we, we repented. We can look at our lives. We could share our testimony about when we did not follow Christ, but now we do. And I'm saying to all of you, which I hope is most of you, we got to repent all the time. But there's all kinds of there's things this week you need to repent of that you know you're doing as a pattern of your life. You need to change it. And so we need to learn how God might be through the external work of circumstance and the internal work of the conviction that we're going to talk about is trying to get you to repent. So let's see if we can understand that. This clearly in verses six through eight is about putting a roadblock up for Paul. And it is, as your worksheet says, a divine one. And I want us to be able to discern it. Discern divine roadblocks. Number one, if you're taking notes, just jot that down because you and I should discern when we're getting knocked off our host, horse, even though it won't be the miraculous actually being thrown down by some bright light and hearing a voice that no one else hears. I'm saying we gotta start with you being knocked off your horse, being arrested, brought to your knees, right? Where you all of a sudden now have circumstances on the outside of your life that say, stop just right now, hold on just a minute. Now, I want you to think about all the things that you purpose to do as a human being, right? Think about it, you, you, you may want to uh, get married, 
right? A young person, and, and maybe you're not a young person, you want to get married. Well, there could be roadblocks on the way to that where you're not, that's not happening. Or you get married, and I remember getting married, and, and we set out to have children, and we encountered this roadblock called infertility. We couldn't, ha- we couldn't have a child. So here, here are these roadblocks, right? You might want to buy a house. I want to buy a house. That just seemed like a normal thing to do, place to live. Didn't want to keep throwing my money into an apartment, but roadblocks, right? For years and years, couldn't, couldn't do it. Here's a roadblock. So I need to understand that there's lots of things I purpose to do, like Paul is purposing here to go his own way, specifically in attacking and persecuting the church. And here's a roadblock. You're not going to go to Damascus, continue to do what you want to do. There's a lot of things you want to do that God has put a roadblock there. Now, before I can talk about roadblocks that I like to call our repentance roadblocks, the whole purpose is for you to repent. I have to start with a sub-point here. Letter A, if you're a note taker, you want to follow my thinking here. Letter A, you need to understand something about roadblocks that are not about repentance. And there are plenty of roadblocks that are not about repentance. And let me just categorize three categories in the scripture. One can be found in a passage I know many of you know, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Jot it down. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, listen to these familiar words. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let the steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Perfect. Teleos. It means that you have this sense of, I've got all the equipment I need to do the thing that God has called me to do. Well, how do I get there? A trial. And a trial, by definition, is you not doing what you want to do. I want to be on easy street. I want to be able to be healthy. I want to get promoted. I want to have gainful employment to pay all my bills. A lot of things we want to do. And then all of a sudden now, I don't get it. It's called a trial. It's not what I want. My path is blocked for whatever the circumstantial reason is. And some of those, I just got to put in category one. Right? The category of non-repentant roadblocks sometimes are God just getting us stronger. I put it this way. Sometimes the roadblock is about building strength. He wants you to be stronger as a stronger Christian. Because if you didn't have any trials in your life, no trials, you would not be the Christian that you are today. Let's say you've been walking with Christ for 20 years. You wouldn't be where you're at if you had easy street from the time you started. So some of those trials, some of your sickness is not about repentance. I got cancer. Well, it may, may, not, may not be a repentance roadblock. It might be, but it may be in the category of just making you a stronger Christian. Okay, number two under roadblocks are not always about repentance. Right? Let's, let's think about Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 9. Acts 16, verses 6 through 9. Years ago when we were in this passage studying through Acts, you might remember Paul is trying to go through Asia. We call it Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and share the gospel. And he got to the heart of it there, in, in, in Antioch, Pisidian Antioch, and we think, okay, now he's just going to spread and do his thing. He's going to move west, and he's going go to go to Ephesus. And I made that case, and I got reasons for it, educated guess as to where he was going on the Roman roads in Asia Minor. And here's what the Bible says. He said, we went through the region of, of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. I'm just saying, okay, what is that? When we study this passage, we're not sure what that is, but whatever it was, it was a divine roadblock. I mean, clearly it was. I mean, they weren't allowed to do it. And then verse seven, it says, so we went up to Mysia, and you might remember the map in that sermon so long ago, dusting off the cobwebs in your brain. And you think about what you saw there. And it says, and they attempted, Luke says of the group on this missionary journey, they attempted to go up into Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus did not allow them to. So however that manifested itself, Luke is already giving us the commentary. God was stopping this from happening. It wasn't, they weren't able to do what they thought they should do. So passing through Mysia, they went down to Troas, which is this po- po- uh, coastal port town in, in, in modern-day Turkey. And, and it says here, Paul then was there. He was in, in the evening. He was trying to sleep. He gets a vision from a man of Macedonia standing up and urging him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. So here is this life where it's roadblock, roadblock, roadblock. You can't do what you plan to do, which seemed like a really good plan. And now you're in a port city and across the sea now, it's not a big, you know, it's not like the Mediterranean, but across this northern, you know, inlet of the Mediterranean, there's Greece, Macedonia and Achaia, the ancient words for, for northern and southern Greece. Uh, and we want you to go there. So God has a plan. So let's put it this way. Some roadblocks are about directing us into more fruitful or strategic paths. Have you ever had that experience? You don't know why something, you don't know why you got laid off. You don't know why you lost the job. You can look at it and say, I was doing a good job, but that job comes to an end. And you don't know why, and it seems sad. It's a trial, it's hard. And then you look for another job, you get in that job and you see this job 
And the way God is using me here, not only to provide for my family, but to make an effect for the kingdom is a more fruitful and strategic path for me to be on. But I never would have taken it, never would have looked for it had this roadblock not stopped it. And I know what that's like in my life. I know what it's like to plan to just be here and settle in and be fruitful and all of a sudden now roadblock and I got to go over here. And it takes time. Sometimes it takes years to look back and say, I see now why God gave me that roadblock there because he's put me into a field or into a pathway that's going to be better for his purposes for my life. All of us have experienced that. So some roadblocks that aren't about repentance are about building strength. Some are about putting us on a path that's going to be more fruitful, more strategic in God's economy. Thirdly, and I can jot down a lot of passages here, but let me just give you one for your notes. First, that's, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 9. I quote this one all the time, and I quote it because it's familiar here to you in this particular context, but Paul says he had plans to do something, but he realizes those plans have to go on hold because right here there's an open door of effective ministry for me, and then it's not a period, it's a comma, but there are many adversaries. Okay, all I'm saying here is the door is open, but there's adversaries, and those adversaries are going to make the good path hard. And the adversaries, that's the word, by the way, if you were to translate it into a proper noun, is the word Satan, <laughs> right? So I know this, Satan as a, as, a, as a figure that is let loose in this world is certainly trying to make the path for you hard. As Jesus repeatedly put it, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If it was hard for me, Jesus says, right, it's going to be hard for you. And he always warned us, the path that you're going to be on, this narrow path, is a hard path. So I know this, sometimes the roadblocks, it feels like a roadblock, is not the roadblock that should make me look for a more fruitful path, and it may be used for my strength, but I need to know it's just part of being in this world. It's part of, here's how I put it, sometimes the roadblock is part of being in a fallen world. And Paul just leans into it, and he continues through that open door, even though there are many adversaries. You know what's an adversary for us living a, a super long, productive uh, life? Let's just say, I want to um, be, be the pastor of this church for 300 years. That's my plan. That's my plan. Do you think I'll have any roadblocks on that plan? <laughs> yeah, I already brought my plot, El Toro Cemetery. So I know I'm already, I'm ready because I know I got a barrier coming and it's called Genesis 3. You're going to die. And I'm kind of looking around thinking I probably won't get to, to live to be, you know, 350 years old. So I don't think I can be here for 300 more years. There is a roadblock. Where'd that roadblock come from? It came from living in a fallen world. And I know this, I would love to have a completely wonderful Ministry here at this church, let's just, I'm making it way too personal, but I just want a congregation and there's no trouble in the congregation at all. Not a, not a single bad apple in the church. That's what I want. Okay. Well, Timothy wanted the same thing in Ephesus. And here was Paul saying, right, there are some in your congregation held captive by Satan to do his will. Now, should he quit and look for a job with a perfect congregation? And there's never going to be one. Why? Because you live in a fallen world. So the roadblock to your plan could be, right? We plan to have three healthy babies. Well, we didn't. We had one rushed into surgery at chalk and one that has all kinds of medical issues. Well, that's a roadblock. It's a roadblock for my expectation, but I know it's part of living in a fallen world. I've written on that, preached on that. It's important for us to know that it's not a repentance roadblock. It's a roadblock that's a part of the adversarial nature of living a Christian life in a non-Christian world. So some things, just that's the way it is. Now, I say all that because all three of the things that feel like they could be repentance roadblocks that we're about to look, look at, they all can immediately be, you know, they can all feel the same, but you've got to discern it. You've got to distinguish it. So I know a lot of the roadblocks in your life, your infertility, your job loss, your cancer, whatever you're dealing with, may not be a repentance roadblock, although a lot of the same things can be. So let's look at this. Let's put it this way. Letter B if you're keeping notes this way, repentance roadblocks can be through the means of, and let's start as general as we possibly can be. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29 through 32. Verses 29 through 32. Context, Lord's Supper, they're doing it wrong. They're messing up. Made it a party and a potluck. It should be about contemplating Christ and thinking about his death and confessing sins. And he says, because you guys are messing up, Mike Fabar's paraphrase, because you're messing up, right? you don't think about how you're living. You don't think about what you're doing. You're drinking and eating judgment unto yourself. Should be the Lord's Supper, should be like Jesus said, but it's not that way because it's all about a party for you. And because of that, he says, many of you are weak and ill and some have even died in your church. Okay, so weakness and illness, right? And death, of course, seems pretty painful. So all of those things are pain 
and they, they're supposed to get you to realize you're doing something wrong. And in this context, you're doing the Lord's Supper wrong. And if you would judge yourselves truly, to quote verse 31, God wouldn't have to judge you. And when you're judged by the Lord, this is discipline. This isn't condemnation being cast into the lake of fire. He's disciplining you so that you're not going to be condemned with the rest of the world. He does not want you to live like the rest of the world. And some of you have foul mouths. Some of you joke at the wrong things. Some of you entertain yourself the wrong way. Some of you get drunk on the weekends. Some of you are involved in, in relationships you shouldn't be in. Some of you are involved in pornography. All these things are going on in our church, and God is going to use pain to say, repent. You need to stop. And sometimes the pain, when we get the pain, immediately someone hands us some remedy. Got a headache, right? Well, here's some Tylenol. You got a problem? Well, here's the fix. And all I'm saying is you should stop to read the tea leaves before you just rush to, well, you know, we live in a fallen world, that stuff happens. Could be, you may end up there, but you gotta end up there by first reading the circumstances and doing what we're gonna say in the rest of this sermon to make sure that it is not God's discipline in your life. It could be pain, weakness, sickness. Let me give you another one. Turn to this one if you would, Haggai chapter one. Sounds hard to find. If you've got an old-fashioned Bible, go to Matthew, turn back four books. Actually, turn back three books, right? Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Well, three doors down. Let's put it that way. You got your little computer or your phone or whatever, or just type it in, Haggai. Haggai chapter one. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three books of the Old Testament are all post-exilic books. And that means after the exile, when they got taken to the doghouse of Babylon and after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple, he takes a remnant over to Babylon and they are there, and then after 70 years, he brings them back. And the remnant, the next generation, they have to rebuild the temple. The book of Ezra is all about this. A man named Zerubbabel is, is, is leading the building project, and they're supposed to go there and focus on, as kind of the governor of the land, they're trying to get everybody to focus on, we've got to rebuild this. We've got to focus on the things that God has called us to do here. So that's the context. Look at Haggai chapter 1, and look at verse 5. I even referenced this in the introduction. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts. This is Haggai chapter 1, verse 5. Consider your ways. Now, this is a double statement of reference to think about stuff. Your life and the things around you that are happening that may not seem connected, but they are. So look, he says now, at the circumstances surrounding you. You've sown much, but you've harvested little. Now, you got some property here. You've come back from Babylon, and you're out there in the heat of the day, in the harvest time, or not the harvest time, the sowing time, and you're out there tilling the land. You got your new, you know, your oxen all worked up. You got, you got, it, you got the, you know, the, the yoke on them. You work so hard to build. You got the ropes. All this, you're working hard. Stuff breaks down. You got to fix it. You got to till the ground. You've, you've got to break up the fallow ground. You got to plant. You got to water. You got to cultivate. You got to pull the weeds. All this work, and at the end of all that, instead of pulling in all this these bushels of wheat instead, right, what happens? You, 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 you harvested little. Well, that's a bummer. I worked really hard. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, and you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages does so to put them in a bag with holes, right? You're making money, but the money just, you know, why? Why don't you get a purse without holes in it? Well, every time I get a new purse, God drills holes in it. And every time I get, a, I get a raise, I still at the end of the month, I can't pay all my bills. Here is, let's call this one, not only does God use pain for repentance roadblocks, sometimes he uses financial problems as roadblocks, financial problems. Right? The financial squeeze, nothing gets our attention like pain, but I guess second to that would be finances. Right? If you are not doing well financially, guess what? God's got your attention. And, and that should arrest, that should knock you off your horse, that should bring you to your knees, and you should say, wow, this hurts. And, and go, keep reading. So he says it again, verse seven, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Verse eight, go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house, right? This is the house now, that I may take pleasure in it, that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Zerubbabel's talking about you guys building this temple, but you're not doing it. No, you look for much, but behold, it came to little. When you brought it home, I blew it away. Who's doing this? God is doing it. God is orchestrating the circumstances to arrest your attention, to bring you to your knees. Why is he doing that, declares the Lord of hosts? Because my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth beneath you has withheld its produce. I've called for a drought on the land. And he goes on and on about all the problems going on economically for these people. Why? Because they were sinning. Some of you have financial problems. Let me just say this as emphatically as I can. Not because you live in a fallen world, not because God's trying to make you stronger, not because he's moving you into a more fruitful field. Okay? You have financial problems because you're sinning, because you have sin in your life that you're not repenting of. 
He uses financial problems sometimes to let you just moan and groan over the fact that you don't make enough money to live the life that you want to live or you think you should live. And all of that is happening in some cases in this room because you are in sin. Those circumstances are to knock you off your horse and to say, God, what is going on here? Consider your ways. So God can use finances. God can use just physical pain. Let me give you one more that may seem like it doesn't work, but it does. Romans chapter two, turn there with me. Just set this up. Romans, right, these Jews that are being addressed in this letter to the Romans, and there were Jews there in the Roman church in, in Rome, they were looking down at the Gentiles, and, and, and here's the essence of the first three verses of chapter two. You guys are condemning the Gentile sinners, the pagans, but you're doing a lot of the same things. You're hypocrites. You're looking down your long Jewish noses at these people that are sinning, but you yourself are doing the exact same kinds of things. Don't you think you're going to be judged for that? And they might say, as they said to Jesus when he started saying things to the Pharisees, we have Abraham as our father. They felt very fine with, with God. And here's Paul's weird response in verse 4. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and his forbearance and his patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Now, I've been talking about two things that are very painful, physical pain and financial pain. And now I'm going to throw a third category in there, kindness, God's kindness. Well, that doesn't hurt. Well, if you were to keep reading in the book of Romans, it does hurt. When you have an enemy that is being mean to you, sinful to you, wrong to you, abusive to you, and you're kind to them. The Bible says it's like you pouring hot coals on their heads. He says, don't be overcome with evil. You overcome evil with good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. All that kindness sometimes is used to kill them, right? Kill them with kindness. You've heard that phrase. And God sometimes does that to you. You might be there knowing that you are doing the wrong thing. You are compromising the rules in your business. You're not functioning well in your home. You're not raising your kids properly. You're saying no to what God says you should say yes to. And God just keeps piling stuff in your lap, right? And you think, well, I must be okay because you said roadblocks are about pain and they're about financial trouble. I got none of that, man. Every time I go to the doctor, super healthy. Every time I look at my paycheck, got more than enough. You know what? Sometimes God uses kindness and generosity that if you really know that you're doing the wrong thing, it starts to bug you, especially when someone in your small group talks about their trials and you start thinking, I really should be experiencing that because I know I'm doing the wrong thing. Sometimes God pours even more on your laps to say, look at what I'm doing. Do you see what's happening here? And the the coals start to sear our brain. God uses kindness sometimes to lead us to repent. That's a roadblock, believe it or not. Sometimes you're like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. Sometimes you say that because you know that you're guilty before God. Repentance roadblocks, I could go on. I'm just giving you a starting point. Can anybody identify with those three categories? I hope in this room. No one's nodding, but I I know you're nodding inside. (laughs) If not, we can just end, end the sermon at this point. But Back to our text. There's a roadblock here. I know it's supernatural for Paul. It's a big light. It's a loud voice. He's down on the ground. What is that for us? It's a lot of different things I tried to teach that. Now, verse 9 and half of verse 10. Now, those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. They didn't get it. They didn't hear it. They, they heard it. They heard something, but they didn't hear what it said. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? Now, what gets him to say that, right? Because he's having a voice speaking to him. No one around him gets it. I just want to think through that. So let's give that a heading because it's an internal alarm that other people aren't having. So in a sense, this is very subjective. He's hearing something. I know it's supernatural, so it's objective, but it's subjective in the sense that everyone around him doesn't see it, doesn't get it, doesn't perceive it. He perceives it. I'll say this. We need to be sensitive, number two, to God's internal alarms. There's alarms that go off inside of us. And usually, I even say that, and I can say that now better than the old days. When an alarm went off at school, right? It still happens, maybe at work, you have a fire drill or whatever. It's just immediate. Well, I just, I, I, I make this more akin, what God is doing in the internal part of our life, the way now my phone wakes me up, which I know I didn't tell it how to do it, but set the alarm, five o'clock, whatever, I'm supposed to get up. And do and you know, how, does yours do this too? Like, Hey, hey, Mike Flabar, are you still tired? I think maybe you should wake up now. Hey, I think you should wake up. Until finally it's shouting at me. Hey, sluggard, get out of bed. 
right? It, it builds. That's how my alarm goes off, right? It, 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 it builds. A lot of these internal alarms are like that. I know for Paul, supernatural, it's almost a comical view of what I'm preaching on this morning because this is not, the, it's not like a voice yelling at you that you're a sinner. It's this thing inside of you that starts to go off. And I want to identify those because some of you right now are having this go on in your life and you, know, you don't see it. But before I get to that, let me just talk about the words that are used in Scripture, okay? I'm going to talk about guilt. And unfortunately, when I say guilt, you think about a feeling. In the Bible, guilt is not a feeling, right? It's an objective judgment. In other words, it is is someone ruling on your life. Guilt in the Bible, the way the word guilt is used, is that when you do the wrong thing, you are guilty. Think about, like, for instance, uh, in Luke, when, when Pilate was having Jesus standing before him, he says, I find no guilt in him. That was not his therapist saying, well, I talked to him. He doesn't, yeah, I don't think he's struggling with guilt. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I am looking at his life and I don't see any rule breaking in him. There's no guilt in him. I found no guilt in him. That means he's not breaking the rules, okay? Now, here's the thing. This week in your Christian life, you've broken some of the rules. Your neighbor, let's just talk about him because it's easier to talk about your neighbor. I don't mean in the church, your next door neighbor, your non-Christian next door neighbor. Has he break, broken any rules? Yes. If I came to him and said, knock, 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 knock. Hey, uh, Mike Fabar is here. I just want to ask the question, uh, are you guilty? Guess what your neighbor would say? Nah. Why? Because he doesn't feel guilty. And you just need to understand guilt in the Bible is not a feeling. Guilt in the Bible is an objective fact, right? What we use the word today as is a subjective feeling. And, and the reality is your neighbor can be guilty and not feel it. And guess what? As a Christian, you can be guilty about the way you use your words, about the way you use your time, about the way you spend your money, about the way you invest your evenings. All of that, you can be guilty before God, and yet you don't feel it. Okay. So what I'm talking about in this, the internal alarms, you may call it guilt, and fine, let's call it guilt if you want, but that's not the usage of the word in the New Testament. There are other words in the New Testament for this and the Old Testament as well. Let's pick some of those. How about this word? This word is used, remorse. Remorse is a feeling. Remorse is my feelings catching up with the judgment of God. If the judgment of God is, Mike Fabares, you're not doing this right, right? When I start feeling remorse, it could be because I'm starting to say, I think I'm doing wrong and I feel bad about that. Here's another word, grief. That's another word used in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about grief that leads to repentance. And that's good because you cannot be forgiven of your sins unless you say that you're a sinner, unless you recognize your sin. So you need to feel remorse. You need to feel grief that's going to lead you to deal with your guilty status. As my dad used to say, right, you feel guilty because you are guilty. Now, that's not true for everybody in the room because some of you have you know, weird feelings and you feel guilty when you're not guilty. But certainly, as my dad raised two boys, we only felt guilty when we were guilty and we often didn't feel guilty when we were guilty. And the point is this. It's good when my feelings catch up with the reality of what dad thinks of me. Right? If dad says you're guilty, you came home late and I didn't feel like I came home late, well, there's objective facts that my feelings should catch up with. You feel guilty because you are guilty, but we're using the word guilt in the first part of that sentence in the modern usage today. But maybe biblically we would say we feel remorse, we feel grief because we are guilty. That might be a more technically, biblically accurate way to say it. Nevertheless, where, what are the ways, once I get that cleared up, that I start to have my internal alarm help me to see that I'm out of step with God this week, right? Well, great, a few ways he does this. Number one, just jot it down, Romans chapter two, verses 15 and 16. Romans two, 15 and 16, it talks about the conscience, and the conscience is at sometimes going to accuse us. So that's a bad feeling, when you're accused as being a bad person, right? When you have this internal thing that the Bible calls a conscience, and of course the context is you could, even, you could go through your whole life without ever reading the Bible, and you'd still have this thing that has Bible written on it called your conscience that is going to say from time to time when you do something that is against the rules of God, you are guilty, right? Saying you are guilty is a feeling of remorse and grief. Our conscience does that. Turn to this one. Here's the second thing I want to add to that. Psalm 32. Psalm 32. If you'd turn there real quickly, I want to show you that the Holy Spirit, right, is like your conscience on steroids, you're, you're, the Holy Spirit is now doing something even more like muscular than your conscience does. And look at how David puts it in Psalm 32. Look at verse 3. David, of course, had sinned. He'd sinned badly, but he didn't want to talk about it. He covered it up. He said, when I kept silent about my sins, my bones wasted away. Wow, did you have osteoarthritis? What's wrong with you? 
No, 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 no. I was just groaning all day long. This is poetic language. It's a song. But he said, I was groaning all day long. For night and day, here it is, it's the Holy Spirit. Your hand was heavy upon me. It's God now pressing on you to feel what? Like my strength was dried up by the heat of summer. Helpful to read poetry sometimes to recognize right, the ways that we might describe our feelings. And in this case, the bad feelings of feeling like oh, my bones don't work and I'm groaning all day and I got the flu and I feel like my, you know, my, 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 my life has no vitality in it because I'm in the middle of the desert without water and yet I'm drinking water all day long. Why? Because the Spirit of God is leaning hard on you. There is grief and remorse that's induced by conscience. There's grief and remorse that's induced by the Holy Spirit. Here's another one, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. You don't need to turn there, but you should read every part of Ecclesiastes in light of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The last two verses of Ecclesiastes help us define the whole book. When it says, this is the end of the matter, you ought to fear God and keep his commandments. Last verse, because everything's going to be judged by God. So Solomon knew, because he had a good dad, right? David was, was, I mean, he was a sinner himself, but he knew the righteous rules. He taught Solomon, and Solomon even you know, wrote about that being raised in, in, in a godly home, the idea of Solomon knowing that he was out of step with the rules of God, that should inv in, invoke some grief and remorse. And it did, but in a particular way in the book of Ecclesiastes. Through, let's use this, number three, if you're keeping track of this, how does God, right, inflict this, this remorse, this internal alarm? Well, he does it through my conscience. He does it through kind of amping up my conscience by the Spirit himself putting his hand hard on me. And then here's the third thing. Let's call it this disillusionment, disillusionment. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and I think I gave you a couple of verses here, verses 9 through 11, that's the, the punchline of him saying, I had everything going for me. I just, I had mansions, I had vineyards, I had, I had women, I had, I had transportation that was the greatest, I had greatest foods, I had everything. And yet inside, I was disillusioned. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, chasing after the wind. Now, it's much like the voice that Saul of Tarsus was hearing, right? Paul, eventually Paul, the apostle, and everyone around him didn't get it. If you and I were in the 10th century BC, I put my arm around you, we looked up at the mansion there with the guards out in front and the gate and the big pathway up to the, you know, the, the mansion that is surrounded by the vineyards of one of Solomon's summer estates. And I said, how do you think Solomon's doing? You go, man, he's doing well. And yet Solomon's sitting there, later reflecting on his life, going, my life stinks. It's kind of like... In Deuteronomy, when, when Moses was predicting something that was going to happen through, of course, the Spirit, a thousand years later, when they would go into captivity, and he says, when this happens, when you're sinning and idolatrous, he says, you will have, be so disillusioned, you'll be so discontented. In the morning, you want it to be evening, and in the evening, you want it to be morning. It's just, you did, nothing will be right for you. And it's the same kind of thing, the internal alarm, where people look at you. It's a lot like God killing you with a kindness. Sometimes he gives you all the stuff you think you want, but what you really need is to be right with God, and so you're disillusioned. And that's how it is for some of you in this room. You got the nicest cars, you got the greatest job, you live in the nicest neighborhood, you got the nicest clothes, everything is good, but inside you know it doesn't work. You can't even enjoy the good gifts of God. Why? Because you got to repent. That's an internal alarm. If you're disillusioned this morning, if you're discontented, Right? The whole book of Ecclesiastes is just trying to scream to you. The end of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commandments. And my question is, is this an internal alarm saying there's some commandments of God you're not keeping? You're not walking faithfully with the Lord? There's something you need to repent of? Are you following this sermon this morning? Right? External barriers, internal alarms. One more, as long as we're in Ecclesiastes, at least in my thinking, I don't know, if you turn there, you might want to turn to that last chapter. It talks about the preacher, uh, which, of course, he's self-identifying here. He's talking to other people about the things he'd experienced. But in verse 10, it says, the preacher sought to find words of delight. Right? And I, that's what I try to do for you every day. The words of delight. And uprightly, he wrote words of truth. Okay? The words of the wise, they're like goads. Well, I'd like to delight you with the sermon this morning, but you're going to go out. Maybe some of you are going, oh, man, that was hard. Is goad. A goad, of course, is some kind of pokey uh, item, uh, tool that you use to get some wayward animal to go the right way. Back to our illustration last week, like wayward sheep, we need to be on the right path. So goads, in this case, are the preacher's words. I mean, they're good words, they're delightful words in a sense, but in reality, they, they hurt. They're like goads. They're pushing me. As a matter of fact, they're like nails, right? They're like nails. Nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. That's a great line. God is behind it all. It's like Nathan telling a story that makes David really mad after he'd had sex with Bathsheba and killed her husband. And in the end of it all, right, it all comes back to sting him. 
It's like you sitting through a sermon one Sunday and you come out and you're wanting to find somebody commiserating with you that that sermon was just way too much. And they're like, no, that was great. It was fine. Yeah, it was good. And they don't get it, but you got wrecked internally by the sermon. See, so sometimes the internal alarms are sounded by the wise words of maybe not the preacher, maybe it's your, uh, uh, some, something somebody said in a small group, some lesson you're, you're reading, some Christian book you're reading. And it could be like on that road to Damascus, you're getting the conviction and the people around you aren't because God's using those words like a surgeon's knife to get into where you're actually at. The wise words of others given by one shepherd. This is a great line. It reminds me of, of Hamlet. Uh, remember uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet in the third act? He has that play going on that makes the king, Claudius, who had killed his brother, feel really guilty. Right? And he's he just internally wrecked by this play. Well, everyone around was just watching. It's just a play. Well, the play hearkened to his sins, and it just, it just wrecked him. And sometimes God uses things in our lives to wreck us inside. It's an internal alarm trying to say, repent, 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 repent. I mean, the crowd, Peter was preaching in Acts 2, and it says they were cut to the heart. Well, not everyone was cut to the heart, but some were cut to the heart. Why? Because God used those words to sound an internal alarm. And just like in our passage, what did the people cry out after they were cut to the heart? After Luke says they were cut to the heart, they said, what shall we do? What must we do? What are we going to do? Paul says the same thing back to our passage, Acts 22, middle of verse 10, right? He says, what am I going to do? And the Lord said, I'll tell you what to do. Get up, get off the ground, go into Damascus. There you're going to be told all that's appointed for you to do. So I'm going to give you more information and more instructions. Well, I couldn't see, verse 11, because of the blindness of light. So I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and I came into Damascus. So here's the scary persecutor of the Christian. He's being led into town like a man trying to grope along a wall because he can't see straight. And here he's brought into town saying, I got, tell me what to do. And we're going to meet a guy next week called Ananias that God is going to use to bring him to faith in Christ. But the repentance of getting knocked off your horse now is followed up by instruction. Just like Peter gave instruction to those that were wrecked on the inside. The alarms went off. Maybe for you, the roadblock's been put up. And you need to know now, now what? Well, now what is you do exactly what God says. Okay, number three, let's put it that way. You need to cling to the prescribed path of life. I love that, prescribed. It's prescribed, it's laid out. In Deuteronomy, by the way, I love that. At the end of it all, this is Deuteronomy, it's the second telling of the law. Moses is retelling the law and he's giving it to the generations that's about to go into Canaan. And he says, I just want you to know, I gave you these rules. He says, and it's not hard. It's not hard, it's not far off. You don't have to send someone to heaven to get it. If you want instruction about how you're supposed to live, you don't have to go into heaven and get it. You don't have to sit in the corner and contemplate life. You don't have to send someone across the sea to get it. It's right there. I've given it to you. It's clear. You know, there's no confusion about gender issues. None, none, none. No issues, no confusion about sexual ethics. None about who you can marry and who you can love. There's no confusion about that. None, none. We don't have to send someone up into space to figure it out. We don't have to send someone to some, you know, ivory tower in Europe to figure it out. It is clear. It's in your mouth, he says. You've read it. I've given you the word. And here's the thing about your problem with all whatever it is that surfaced in your mind, the pornography, your cursing, your compromise at work, your cutting corners, your stealing, whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever your sin is, right? The answer is not hard. It's there. I love that it's objective. It's not subjective. I love that it's clear. It's prescribed. It's not distant. It's not unclear. It's right there. There are words according to Psalm 119 that are to be followed. Follow them. God has a prescribed path. Just do it. It's right there. It's clear. You know our theme verse for the church? Anybody know that? Psalm 43.3? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Right? We call Compass Bible Church because the idea is the preaching of the word in this room and in every other room on this campus is supposed to help people see the truth, the path, the right way, the narrow path, the small gate. Get on the narrow path and, and walk it. And, and I love the next line. And let them bring me to your holy hill, to your dwelling that I will go then to the altar of God. I can go with exceeding joy and I will praise you with the lyre, right? The, the, the harp, oh God, my God. Here's the point. This is not about you being the hall monitor of the 21st century, right? Even though I'm happy to tell people, right? Call me into the network, tell, I'll tell you what the Bible says, fine. I, I know you won't like it, but I'll tell you. But it's not about me being the hall monitor in the sense that I just wanna be a goody two-shoes clinging to the right path. I wanna be on the path that's gonna lead me to God. That's what, I wanna be in with God. I want to be in with God because I know there there's exceeding joy. To quote one more passage, Psalm 16, verses 9 through 11. There's no better place to be than with God. 
You have the right path as opposed to the wrong path. You do your business right instead of illegally. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be closer to God. Right? You're going to have a closer walk with God. You're going to repent of doing it wrong, and you're going to start doing it right. You're going to stop with that relationship you know you shouldn't have, and you're going to do it right. It's going to hurt. I get it. The path is going to hurt. Paul's eyes hurt. He couldn't see. He had to grope for direction. But you don't have to grope for long. We don't need to find Ananias here in, in Orange County. It's in the Word. It's prescribed. It's clear. It's objective. Now you just got to do it. And God will give you the help to do it. He will lead you by the hand to do it. And when you get there, you realize you've drawn near to God, and He's drawn near to you. That's the good news of repentance. Repentance leads you to have God, God himself. i got to read you the text in the words, at least the English words of the text. Therefore, my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh dwells securely. You walk on the right path, you will feel the security of doing what you know God wants you to do. He will not abandon your soul to Sheol or let the Holy One see corruption. Right? You walk on the path, he's going he's to guard you in that path. You make known to me the path of life, verse 11, and in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand, love this, there are pleasures forevermore. What we want to do is the right thing. We do the right thing, right? I'd rather be close with God than get the promotion at work. I'd rather be right with God, right, than be cancer-free. I'd rather be right with God and walk closely with him than whatever it else is that this roadblock has done, infertility, singleness, whatever the problem is, right? Get me close with God because there is joy. And even whatever deprivation you feel like you're going to have to go through, right, all of that's going to end one day, and we're going to be in the presence of God. And that's a good thing, and it's helpful for us, but it's not going to happen without repentance. And Paul's circumstances externally and internally needed to be read, and it wasn't hard because they were supernatural for him. You, though, look at the stuff that's at the bottom of the cup at the end of the day and ask yourself the question, what is God saying by any of this? And, and, and I tell you what, if you need to repent, repent. Get on the right path drawn near to God. Got the ushers coming down with the elements of the Lord's Supper. I did quote 1 Corinthians 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, you know, you're being judged in your life because you're not doing something right. In that case, it was the Lord's Supper. And I'm saying the Lord's Supper has always then become this catalyst for us in introspectively looking at our lives. So as the ushers pass these elements, just hang on to that piece of bread and hang on to that cup. If you're a Christian, we're going to take this together as Christians here today. If you're not a Christian, just hang tight. We're almost done. But you take those elements and you do the thing that is required in the context. And I know their problem was how they took the Lord's Supper, and we trust we're doing it right. But here's the idea. I need to ask myself, what am I doing, Lord? Psalm 139, right? Try me, know me, know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What's the right path? What's the right way? So if there's, let's just put this sermon into practice right now. You got roadblocks this week. You got internal alarms going off, right? Just confess it to God. Don't be Judas that just feels bad, right? And you just sit there and beat yourself up, right? Repent. Let the remorse lead to repentance. And the repentance leads to, as he puts it in that passage, salvation. I want to be saved from the consequences of enslavement to sin. I want to be on the path that draws me near to, to God. So you spend some time doing that. I'll come back up in a couple of minutes here. We'll take these elements together. But I'd love for you just to privately and silently talk to God about where you're at. In prep for this sermon, I couldn't help but think of the theme of repentance and remorse from Shakespeare's play, Hamlet. And that's why I spent time rereading a lot of that this week. And I, uh, I think that scene where after the play, Claudius, the king of Denmark, is so convicted about the murder of his brother, he goes into his chambers and he starts to have this, uh, this prayer just leak out of his life. Hamlet ends up, if you remember the play, ends up hiding in the corner and all that. He wants to kill him. But the scene there, Shakespeare puts words in his mouth that are, that are so a, akin to what we're talking about here today. He sees his sin and he feels his sin because of the conviction of that play. And he says, oh, my, my sin, it, 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 it stinks, it smells, right? It's rank. It smells to the heavens, right? In other words, I, I know this is offensive. It's offensive to God and I see it. And then you see this sense of where he wants to keep it hidden, but, but he doesn't. There's a line just a few lines later. He says, my stronger guilt right, defeats my strong inclination, my strong intent. In other words, there's this sense of, of him like wanting to keep it covered up, but his guilt is too great. He just can't continue. Then he asks the question, which sadly doesn't answer properly, but Shakespeare puts the line in his mouth that reflects Isaiah chapter 1. 
And he says, is there not enough rain in the sweet heavens to wash it, my sin, as white as snow? And I'm thinking a few things when I, when I hear those words in the play. Well, yeah, there is, but it's not rain. Right? It's depicted by what's held in our hands right now. Right? It, it's the body and blood of Christ. And there is enough, right? There is enough in this fount, as the hymn writers put it, that can take your sins, though they be like scarlet. They'll be red like crimson, and, and they can make it white as snow. So yeah, whatever it is that you surfaced in your heart today in this message, gone. As far as the east is from the west, to quote Psalm 103, it can be removed from you. And there is enough. There is enough in the atonement of Christ to make your sins white as snow. Good line to ask and and good line for us as Christians to answer. Uh, It is sufficient. The grace of God through the death of Christ that we celebrate by these elements and we remember his death, we proclaim it through this act, is sufficient for you to leave today, to get in your car and drive away from this campus forgiven. What we need is to think a little bit like Claudius. My, my sin is rank and my guilt is bigger than my desire to cover my sin. And so I'm ready to say, yeah, God, I accept the death of Christ, not just as the whole of my life being plunged into forgiveness that is found in the cross, but I want the sin applied to this sin the way I've done this, that, or the other, or the way I've neglected this, that, or the other. I I, I confess it. I repent. And then we drink and eat this so that we remember the provision that's given to us in Christ. And it's complete. We confess our sins. He's faithful and righteous to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's eat this bread and drink this cup together. God, we talk about things that surface memories in our minds of recent past and for some in this room I'm sure distant past but we want to see the promises of Christ as transcending the guilt of our sin the remorse, the pain, the grief that we feel, we want to say all of that should lead us to a genuine freeing repentance and so we do that this morning with a full trust in the propitiation of Christ on a cross that he died to absorb the penalty to say that we are today free from that. There's no condemnation for us in Christ as we continue to pull close to you in our walk. God, keep us on the path of righteousness this week as we walk closely with you in Jesus' name.